Mark, good to finally get you back. It's been a few years since you were on Real Vision. It has. It's good to be back, Raoul. Thanks for having me. So give everybody a bit of an instruction about yourself, what you do, that kind of stuff. Well, I'm a gold dealer uh, by trade, Raoul. I've been working in precious metals now for 15 years. Every day of my life is dedicated to helping people buy and sell precious metals and move uh, that, that metal around the world, uh, whether they want to keep it with us in Grand Cayman or have it stored in another strategic location. That's basically what I spend my time doing, aside from managing SWP. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit of background for people. I mean, you know, the story is, you know, I bumped into you guys when I was looking at setting up a gold vault in Grand Cayman, thinking, you know, it's probably the best jurisdiction in the Western Hemisphere. It's tax-free. It's a perfect place for a gold vault. There's nothing here. And then suddenly I came across you guys who were building a kind of state-of-the-art gold vault. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. I'm giving up. I'll leave it to you guys. Uh, but I think in the end, it turned out for the best because you ended up starting Real Vision shortly thereafter. So it, it, I think uh, it worked out for both of us. I'm happy to see you guys succeeding. And uh, yeah, it's been a success story for us as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. So look, I'm, you're seeing a lot on the ground because you're seeing the buying and selling. So talk us a little bit through the journey of this year because we were talking off camera you're like oh my god it's been a crazy year <laughs> so, so so talk us through you know the interest in the metal space and what, and what you're seeing well right now we're seeing unprecedented demand for physical precious metals from the retail investors and what's most striking to me about that is the fact that it's not only the typical gold bugs the guys that you expect to always be stepping into the metals whenever there's any action it's actually a whole new audience of buyers. And from what we can tell, it is mid to high net worth individuals who are trying to balance their portfolios, reposition money. And they're, they're coming into the precious metal space pretty significantly. I mean, these are decent sized transactions that we're seeing. So to me, that's an indicator that we're now firmly entrenched in a bull market, that this is first and second page news. And what that translates into for for the retail physical metal space is just you know an increase of demand of about three to four hundred percent year over year. Um, so it's extreme, wow. yeah, it's extremely busy days for the entire precious metal space, not only in North America but worldwide. And are these kind of guys the people who who are trading it, or they're just buying and holding it? Well, we we tend to specialize in we specialize in long term storage. So most of our clients are buying and holding at least for the midterm, mostly for the long term. But you're obviously seeing others using paper products or ETFs, uh, mining stocks. They're using all kinds of different vehicles to come in and out rather quickly. And because the market is so volatile, I think there is an opportunity to actually day trade precious metals right now and and make a profit. It's not necessarily something I would recommend personally, but you're definitely seeing people do that. Most of our clients, however, are more buy and hold. And what's the kind of, um, what are you seeing in silver as well? Because you, you also store and sell silver, so. We do, silver is being, silver is extremely volatile during volatile market periods. So right now- yeah, like today, right now, it's been a volatile day. Exactly, you know, silver I think is down, what, I haven't looked at the charts in the last hour or so, but it was down earlier in about 5%. The other day, it was down 15%. I hadn't seen that in my entire career. I'd never seen silver be down 15%. But the reason that that happened is it had had like eight consecutive trading sessions where it was actually up 3 or 4% during those trading sessions on a daily basis. And then people started taking some profits. And then the stop loss orders started to take effect. So we saw the price move down rather quickly. But silver has definitely been the story as of late, because if, if you look back over the last 10 years, silver investors you know, were just whining and complaining because silver had been so dormant. It really hadn't given them any returns. A lot of them were flipping it into crypto. I remember when Bitcoin really got hot, a lot of guys were selling their silver positions, moving into crypto, and maybe that was the right choice at the time. But for those who held out, uh, silver has definitely started to make that move that they were expecting. And all of this is completely normal in a precious metals bull market. We expect silver to outperform gold and to perform very, very well. However, the difference with this bull market so far is the speed and velocity at which all of this happened. I mean, usually these markets will take a year, two years, three years to kind of work their way up to, to what we're seeing now. But in this case, it took literally four months. After the corrections that we saw in March, where the equity markets pulled back, precious metals pulled back, once that was done, 
for precious metals, silver and gold just basically took off from then. And silver is up about 55% since the beginning of April. Yeah, I mean, last time I saw you was at a drinks event in Grand Cayman. You were giving away silver. <laughs> we were. We were. I think you won some of it, too, if I'm not mistaken. I did. But... <laughs> I did. It's now gone up a lot in price. It's gone up 55% since then. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, silver's not... There, there was a time, you know, within the last year or two where you could pick up an ounce of silver for about 12 or $13. And that's really the point in time where investors should have been loading up on gold and silver. It was during those pre-crisis dormant periods. You know, those are those are the buying opportunities that unfortunately a lot of investors miss. And now we're into the bull market. We're well entrenched into the bull market. A lot of people would say we're about a year in really. Ever since gold broke the $1,300 resistance mark back in May of 2000. In 19, I believe it was. Ever since then, the price started to slowly move upwards. And then as COVID set in, which you called back in February of this year, I remember that was a pretty amazing call looking back at it. Um, ever since that point in time, we've just, you know, we're, we're in a different phase of this bull market now. And unfortunately, a lot of people are just starting to, like I said, reallocate their funds towards precious metals at this point in time. So they're, they're catching up, but I think there's still a long way to go. Talk to me a little bit, before we get into a bit of the, the backdrop and uh, the bigger picture view, talk to a little bit about why you guys set up in the Cayman Islands. Because, you know, obviously I live here, but I just think it's fascinating because, you know, I've been a big proponent of what you do. I store my uh, gold with you guys and we have a deal with Real Vision. That there'll be a link below this. So Real Vision guys, if they're interested. But I did it not because we're mates, but I'm just passionate about... Cayman Islands and this opportunity and why gold matters um, for here, why this is a great place. Talk, talk people through that a bit, because I think it's going to be interesting to people because they need to choose where to store gold. Right. So I won't name names, but there are a few older gentlemen living in Grand Cayman that have been living there for about 40 years that are family members of the founders of SWP. So they're like the one generation above the founders of SWP. These two guys, very successful investors, they helped build the country that, that you now enjoy and that I lived in for three years and loved. And they planted the seed about a decade ago to our founder, Shane Stewart, myself, and said, look, guys, Grand Cayman does everything in terms of financial services. It is now a, a major player in the global financial services market. But one thing it doesn't have is a gold vault. And they also happen to be gold and silver investors you know, for many, many years. So they saw the value in precious metals as a long-term investment. And so they kind of planted the seed with, the, with Shane and Stewart and said, look, nobody's doing it here in Grand Cayman, or at least those who have tried never did it properly. So let's build a state-of-the-art facility. Let's attract some U.S. wholesalers, some U.S. refineries uh, that will make a market inside the vault, which is so important. That's one of the reasons SWP has been able to succeed is because we provide liquidity within the vault. Whether you're buying or selling, you have access to metal either that's in inventory, we can bring it in from the States very quickly. And when you sell that metal, you're not waiting weeks for your money. It's settled within a day or two. So we basically replicated a major market like New York City or London. Yeah, I mean, or I'm, you know, to be honest, and again, not blowing your trumpet, but I was blown away how fast you can execute. You think, right. I was thinking Cayman Islands is going to be a nightmare, can't get any metal. <laughs> it was very straightforward. So that was the idea. It was to replicate a major market in a country that is obviously optimal for you know, financial services or wealth preservation or wealth um, custodianship. And, and, and we were successful in doing that. And uh, thankfully, you know, we're very close to the U.S. market. So that you know, the proximity with the U.S. market is, is a major uh, uh, unique selling proposition for SWP. It's, it's brought us a lot of American clients who, who want offshore storage, but didn't necessarily want to go all the way to Zurich or all the way to Singapore, which had really been the major hub for a number of years before SWP showed up in the Cayman Islands. And talk a bit about, because it's just fascinating, about building a gold vault. <laughs> how, did, how, did they, how did the guys go about doing that? And, you know, because that's, that's a big thing, right? I'm going to build a gold vault. It is. Thankfully, so the background of the two, my two partners, one of them was in the security business. Uh, he was the president of Security Center International, which is a, a major security company in the Cayman Islands, which you're familiar with. And the other was in the construction business. So they ran Phoenix Construction. And so between the two of them, they had a good idea how to build a very secure building. But the logistics is basically you order a prefabricated vault 
from an American company who specializes in, in bank vaults. They, they build vaults in New York City for Chase and some of the major financial institutions. So we ordered the, the vault. It was shipped in uh, by cargo ship. Uh, you know, the, the tonnage involved. I mean, these are 11 inch steel reinforced concrete walls. You can imagine the cost to bring that to Cayman. Just, you know, you know how things are there. So it took about six months, I think, for all the materials to, to arrive. And then they, they actually had to insert this prefab vault in a building that was being built. Uh, so it was a new construction and a new build that was going up and they managed to insert the vault. Uh, it's just an engineering feat, to be honest. Some of the pictures would make you laugh of uh, forklifts kind of pinning down other forklifts as they tried to erect the walls of the vault. It was, it's kind of fascinating stuff. But at the end of the day, we ended up with a class three vault. It's it's the highest rating that you can have for uh, for a for any vault, basically, in the North American space. And uh, you know what? The problem is now, Raleigh, it's getting pretty full. So we actually have to expand uh, over the next year or two. Yeah, I noticed it. that last time I was in it, it was pretty full. So it's like, you don't want to build another one. Well, we, we're going to have to. I mean, you know, this was always a long-term business plan for us. And and because of, we, you can never predict when the bull market is going to hit. But now that it's hit, like I said, sales are up three to 400%. That's also three to 400% new accounts and space required for those accounts. And then with all of the hype that precious metals is experiencing right now, and justifiably so, you're seeing some very large players, some um, trusts, some funds that are reallocating their precious metals, moving their precious metals outside of the United States into places like Cayman. And so those guys obviously take up quite a bit of room when they come down. So you guys also have um, storage elsewhere in the world. How does that all work? Right. So we own and operate the vault in Grand Cayman. The, the other vaults that we offer worldwide are, are operated by other vault operators. So Loomis International, for example, is a big name a lot of people are familiar with. Brinks is another player in the industry. Malka Amit, if you've done business in Asia, you're probably familiar with Malka Amit. So these companies own their own vaults and then SWP will sublease space from them inside the vaults and then lease that space out to our own clients. So what we came to realize, as much as we love Cayman and Cayman is a fantastic jurisdiction, people want to store their wealth in multiple jurisdictions, geodiversify geo their wealth. And so we started to offer these different locations worldwide. We now offer the United States, Canada, uh, UK, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Singapore, and all the way down into New Zealand as well. So kind of every tax zone or strategic zone in the world, we now offer storage and trading to our clients. And how do you guarantee, because one of the people, the reasons, um, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to get you on, because people talk about gold in financial market terms, but you're talking about physical. Why, mm -hmm. you know, what are the benefits of, of having physical gold versus paper gold? It's, it's so important. It's a really good question, because unfortunately, for a lot of people, when they do invest in precious metals, they really have no idea what they're actually investing in. They, they don't read the fine print. They don't read the contracts. They don't bother. They just want get, to get it done and get on with it. But it's really important that you understand what you own because otherwise you could find yourself in situations that you know might be unfortunate or you might have felt misled in the end. So what we do is we sell it what I call very old school ways, physically allocated and segregated. So when you buy from us, you're buying physical bars and coins that go into a little box that's your dedicated box, or it could be a big box if you have a lot of stuff. And that, that box is in a particular part of the vault stored on a shelf. So it's fully allocated, fully segregated from any assets belonging to anyone else. The important thing there, I think, is that when people are looking for the ultimate hedge, for the ultimate store of wealth, without any question marks, without any caveats, they are able to do that when they buy physical metal that is fully allocated to them. Because legally speaking, when you own physical gold or silver, it's considered personal property. So all SWP does is basically act as the custodian of your physical personal property. And we ensure that personal property so that if anything were to ever go wrong inside one of the vaults, that you'd be that that material would be replaced to the full market value. So if you're, you're looking to eliminate as much risk as possible when investing in precious metals, that method is probably the best method for you. But there are other ways, of course, to invest in precious metals, and they all have their pros and cons, I guess you could say. And how do you know that the partners that you choose are fully segregating the metal? I mean, because, you know, this is, it's a weird old world in gold. You don't know who's using your gold for what purposes. How do you know that? Right. So there's, there's kind of two ways to know that, actually. First of all, is, is before it even gets to the vault, is we're ordering that gold 
from refineries, directly from refineries that are the producers of the finished bullion products that we're selling, or directly from distributors of the refineries or the mints like the Royal Canadian Mint, the US Mint. So our trading lines are directly to those sources. So when we order from these sources, we're sure that the product that we're ordering, it's not just a paper receipt, it's not just a promise to deliver later, it's a physical product that's actually shipping from Texas to Singapore, to New Zealand. And I know this because I have to do, or my team has to do the customs paperwork, the logistics that are involved in moving metals around the world. So the first step is we know that we're ordering physical metal. Now, once it gets to the vault, the things that we we look for are basically vaulting partners that have a good reputation that have been around a while. They check all the boxes, they're fully insured, but we go and we audit those facilities once a year. We hire a third party called Bureau Veritas, which is the world's largest commodities auditor. They audit everything from grain to precious metals, oil and gas. They send someone over and they do an independent audit and then send us the report. So they physically count the bars and coins that are in our accounts and in our clients' accounts and and then uh, provide us with a statement of such. So there's a few ways, but I mean, the best way to ever check that it's real and, and we actually invite our clients down to Cayman is to come for yourself. Go to the vault. You're allowed to visit. You're allowed to see your own precious metals. We'll arrange that for you. And you can see it with your own eyes and touch it with your own hands. Yeah, nobody's allowed in Cayman right now. We don't want any visitors, <laughs> that's particularly true. Dece- the US. Might be December 1st, I hear now, for Cayman. So that's, uh, yeah, we can talk about COVID and the disruptions in the supply chain. I mean, it's been... Yeah, we'll come, on, we'll come on to the market in a second. I just want to ask a couple more questions, because again, a lot of people are going to be interested in physical, because a lot of people trade GLD or you know whatever it may be. What kind of... People think, oh my God, you know... if. There's two things. Firstly, they think of the physical metals market for retail, you know, retail meaning a, a reasonable amount. They think of it as some spammy advert on CNBC about gold eagles. Why mm-hmm. is it different? Why is it different than that? You know what, Ralph? Every time I travel to the states, those ads drive me crazy. It really, it really raises the hairs on my neck because there's a lot of people in this industry that do a phenomenal job providing exactly what investors need and what they want, which is competitively priced precious physical precious metals and unfortunately you have people that can afford ads on cnbc are generally the guys that are taking advantage uh, and misleading investors and selling them overpriced coins limited edition coins you know taking out adverts in 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 magazines and, and taking advantage of seniors who don't understand what they're buying and it happens and it's really unfortunate and what kind um, of spreads are they charging those guys the, I, 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 I try to ignore them, but honestly, their spreads are, if, if you did, if you took 30 minutes to do some homework, you'd realize very quickly that what they're offering you is, you know, um, completely unreasonable or it's a lost leader. So what they're trying to do is give you a phenomenal deal on your first purchase and then they've got you in the door and they're shoving collectible coins down your throat. They're cold calling you at, or they're calling you at home and trying to pressure you into sales. And unfortunately it does happen. So you want to be very selective about the precious metals company you decide to do business with. Thankfully, there are many reputable companies out there. So reputation in our industry eliminates a lot of the risk for the investor. That is key. I always, people always say, how do I make sure I don't get scammed? How do I make sure I'm buying real products? Number one, deal with a reputable company. If you do that, you will eliminate 99% of the risk up front. So if you see guys on TV, I'm not saying they're not legitimate. I'm not saying that they will take advantage of you, but chances are, uh, if they can afford that advertising, that uh, they've got a few tricks up their sleeves. And so what kind of costs are involved for the average person in terms of storage costs and you know, spreads versus the price they see on the screen? So they want to buy you know, some precious metals, they want to buy 50 grand worth of precious metals. They see a price on the screen. How different is it? You know, is it a scary world or is it you know, relatively close to that? And, you know, what are the storage costs for people? I don't think, yeah, I don't think it's a scary world at all, actually. Uh, and, and that is one piece of misinformation out there is that it's very expensive to buy precious metals and it's very expensive to store precious metals. But generally, the example I used is this. If you're buying, if you're investing anything more than 50,000 US dollars in precious metals, you will be able to buy products that have relatively low spreads over the spot price. Uh, or a, a low premium over the spot price. If you can afford a one kilo gold bar, which is 32 ounces of gold, which is a, a very popular size gold bar for investors to invest in, uh, you can obtain spreads anywhere from one to 2% over the spot price. 
And that's even in a market like today where demand is at an extreme and premiums are basically as twice as high as they usually are. So during normal market, you'd usually pay about 1% over the spot price for a kilo gold bar. When you sell it, you'll probably get about, you'll probably be paying about half a percent or expect to receive half a percent under the spot bid price. So total spread is about 1.5% on the and that's transaction. Delivered, that's delivered to the vault or is delivery on top? That includes delivery to the vault. And then your storage fees are generally going to be about half a, half a percent or 50 basis points per year. So your total cost, 1.5% in and out plus your half, half a point a year. And if you compare that to any fund management fees, ETF management fees, it's very much in line. So it, it really is a misconception, I think. When you get into coins or smaller denominations of precious metals, the premiums will be higher. And now that we're in this extreme demand period, obviously premiums have risen. But if you speak to experienced traders, they'll still be able to find you a deal. Now, you mentioned before about a supply issues in gold and maybe silver as well. Talk us through what you're seeing in that. Yeah, it's uh, it, look, COVID has been both a catalyst uh, and an accelerant for this bull market in precious metals. It triggered or was a p- big part of what started the rush and it has really helped with the velocity. All that uncertainty that it cla- caused has really pushed up that price and demand for precious metals. But on the flip side of that is it's causing havoc in the supply chain. From the mines that are not able to operate in Mexico, there was mines that were closed for a month or two in Mexico. They, they, couldn't, they wouldn't send their staff into the mine to actually extract the metal from the ground to the mints like the Royal Canadian Mint, which has experienced you know, a, a complete shutdown for six weeks and then has come back with reduced staff and, and COVID measures like every other business out there in the world. And then to the logistics side where, uh, you know, things just aren't moving as quickly. FedEx and Cayman wasn't delivering for a while. FedEx in other jurisdictions wasn't delivering for a while. Customs in these countries are all backed up because they're half of their staff are working from home. They're not in the customs warehouse clearing packages. So the entire supply chain has been interrupted by COVID. And so right now you're looking at delivery times. If you ordered precious metals today, probably have about four weeks delivery before it physically arrived to its destination. Well, and has that done anything to the price? Is that part of the thing driving up the price or is it just driving up premiums? So you know, how does that manifest itself in the market? It is, it is driving up both because the premiums, to give you an example, if the Royal Canadian Mint is trying to produce as much product as it possibly can with the staff that it has available, they're going to focus on their best-selling products. They're going to produce one-ounce silver maple leaves, 100-ounce silver bars, one-ounce gold maple leaves. The other products that they generally produce and are available to the market are no longer available to be ordered at all. So it's going to drive up the premium of what is available and couple that with just the overall extreme demand for those products. Dealers have now have kind of uh, the opportunity to charge their clients more for the same amount of metal as pre-crisis. So it definitely has an effect on the premiums. I think for the overall market price, COVID is more of an underlying factor. Um, it's one of the reasons why people feel so uncertain right now. And so it, it's not a direct impact on the price of gold, other than the fact that it contributes to the overall uncertainty in the market. And that drives people towards gold. They're not feeling sure. They're feeling unsafe. They go to gold. Uh, and also the monetary printing, obviously. Yes. Well, there's a, there's a number of reasons. Yeah. But you know a lot more about those reasons than I would. Um. The other thing I have no idea, I have no understanding, why do people care about Krugerrands versus Maple Leafs? But, I mean, who cares? It's gold, right? And if it's assayed and it's proven to be 99.9% pure, why do you care which government stamp it's on it? That's a good question. It, uh, you know, I I've hear never that under- a lot. I've never understood it. People are like, oh, God, I've got these Krugerrands. I'm like, so? Yeah. It's gold. I, you know, my mentor taught me you should buy as much gold with your dollars as you can afford. So in most cases, you should actually buy bars because the premiums are lower than coins. You know, bars don't have the the fancy government stamp. They don't have the queen's face on the back of the coin. But like you said, it really doesn't matter because you're owning, you're buying ounces of gold and that's what you should be focused on. There are some coins that do have better reputations worldwide. For example, the US Eagle. I mean, most gold investors and any precious metals dealer anywhere in the world is familiar with a gold eagle. So you could argue that the liquidity is slightly better on a gold eagle than, say, a gold Britannia. 
but a new why, Cayman or a Krugerrand. But why would it be? I mean, it's it's, a, it's basically 100% gold. So just because it's got a US stamp on it, I mean, it, it seems kind of crazy. So, so this is what it boils down to. Picture this. You are an investor. I'm a dealer. We're in a small town in rural America. You come to me with a gold eagle in one hand and a gold crew ground in the other. So as a dealer, I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm going to buy this stuff from Ralph because I want to turn a profit today. But in order to do that, I need to sell it to the next guy that walks in the door. What is the next guy more willing to buy, the gold eagle or the gold crew ground? So my point being, when you're in a small market, things like that can matter. It can affect your liquidity because there's not a lot of buyers and sellers. And the broker is really thinking, where can I maximize my return? But in a large market like SWP in the Cayman Islands or any of the vaults in the major cities, there's buyers and sellers for every product imaginable. You could walk in there with a Dory bar from North Africa and someone will buy it because it's gold. They'll have it refined and turned into USD or back into pure gold. So in, in small markets, it can affect liquidity and it can matter. But in major markets, which is really where you should be investing your money, it won't matter at all. So here's a lovely story for you. So back in 2003, there was a crisis in Argentina. And Argentina basically devalued their currency about, about 90%, took all the money from the back, converted all the US dollars into Argentine pesos, devalued the whole lot, wiped out everybody's savings, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole country was wiped out, and it basically went to barter for a period of time while everyone was scrambling around trying mm -hmm. to find currency that worked. So obviously, this is the gold bug's favorite thing. This is like a total currency collapse, and this is the time for gold. Problem was, exactly the issue you had is nobody knew what gold was worth. So if you came with an ingot or you know, a gold mm. bar or whatever, you take it to a dealer in a small town in Argentina, they're like, I have no idea what this is worth. I can't tell if it's real gold, not real gold. So what happened is the entire market outside of the big cities where people knew what they were doing, but this kind of small market traded on 18 karat gold jewelry prices. So whatever jewelry you bought, whether it was nine karat or 24 karat, 22 karat, everybody priced it at 18 karat to say, fine, roughly most jewelry is 18 karat, we'll be pretty much safe with that. And they wouldn't accept pure gold coins or anything else. They might have accepted gold eagles, but almost everything else they refused to accept because they couldn't value it. Well, I mean, look, yeah, I'm, I'm like you. I'm, I'm a pretty simple-minded guy in terms of if it's gold, it's gold. But as you pointed out, there is an underlying message there is if you are going to invest in precious metals, you should be buying something that's produced by a reputable or recognized producer as a, as a bottom line, which when you buy from a precious metals dealer, you're going to receive anyways, as opposed to buying gold off the street, buying scrap gold, buying gold from pawn shops, you know, buying nuggets online. You know, there's different ways that you can buy physical metal. But again, if you want to, you want to ensure liquidity and ensure that you will find a buyer at some point in time, you should buy something that has a recognized stamp on it. And there are lists that exist that will provide you with the list, uh, the names of the refineries that are called, you know, recognized and reputable refineries. So talk me through the stamps on top of the gold bars and, and the silver. What, what are they all about? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's it's basic information. They've been yeah, using them. Don't, they see pictures of gold bars. Then <laughs> actually knows what any of this stuff is because most people haven't bought gold bars. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it, it's true, and and it's not overwhelming. But if you didn't know what to look for, you might you might think to yourself, I don't understand what I'm looking at right now. But generally, when you see a stamp on a bar, what you'll see is the name of the refinery. So that will tell you where was this produced, where was it mined, was it in Kazakhstan. Was it a North African mine or a North African refinery? Was it a Canadian refinery, a Swiss refinery? So the name of the producer of the bar will be on there. The weight of the bar, which is generally going to be in troy ounces or grams in Europe because they use the gram system for the weights of their products. The purity. So you're always looking for those three nines or four nines. So 99.9% .9 pure. Generally, most bullion products are 99.9% .9 pure plus. And some of them will also have a serial number on them. Not all, but some bars will have a unique serial number, which the producer uses as a means to kind of control the production and make sure that nobody's replicating their products and tracking what's shipping out when. But it's pretty standard information. I mean, it's been stamped on metals, you know, since the dawn of man, since they started using precious metals as currency. They always put something on it so that it couldn't be replicated or defrauded. So. And... Um... 
metals assay. Talk people through what that means, you know, that it's verified essentially by somebody. How does that work? Yeah, if you ever get the chance to go to a mint, uh, if you happen to be in Ottawa at the Royal Canadian Mint with your family, or, or you can visit one of the four uh, United States mints, it's such a fascinating process. I, I, I used to haggle with mints about pricing for bars until I actually visited one of their facilities and saw how many steps was involved to produce this fine metal, this 99.9% .9 pure metal, which at the end of the day is really what the assay's output is is to ensure the purity of a product. Because what you don't want, let's say you invested in your kilo gold bar and you just assumed it was pure, but in reality, it was only 97% pure. Well, you would have actually lost 3% on your investment immediately because you bought a bar that wasn't pure. So the assay or the purification of precious metals, removing all of the other elements that came in with that gold from where it was mined, basically, when it was a rough bar, uh, it's the process of assaying the bar into its purest form into that 99.9% .9 gold or silver. So again, that's why when you buy this stuff, you want to make sure that it has a stamp from a recognizable refinery because then you can be assured that it has gone through the process, this 60-step process that they have to ensure the purity of the gold. And if you want to get it tested, companies like ours or, or other companies in, in the industry will be able to do non-destructive tests on the metals to verify that they are in fact pure. So if you get metal that's not been stamped or you know, come from a proven entity, you can get the dealer or the vault to check it for you and say, okay, this is what the purity value is, et cetera. Exactly. You're, basically, you'd be dealing with scrap gold. So everything other than pure bullion falls into that category. Your jewelry at home, uh, coins, old coins, old currency coins, uh, US currency, Canadian currency that used to cont contain silver and gold, um, nuggets. I mean, all of that would basically be sent to a refinery, melted down into finished product. Um, what about ownership? Who do people have to declare gold? So if you store gold, is it kind of out of the system or is it in the system? How how far out? Because one of the things about gold, people talk about it being kind of out of the financial system. It's not financialized because, as you said, it's segregated and you own it. But how is it? Is it declared? Is it taxed? How does that all work? It's, what does an American really have to do? For example, an American have to do? If they buy gold, stores it in the Cayman Islands, what next? Is the IRS going to come right. knocking on his door? Okay, so it's it's a two part answer. It depends where you buy it. It it can even the the laws can vary from state to state. So there are some states in America where the dealer actually has to declare clients' purchases to their state government. There are other states where that doesn't happen, and so that's really in terms of the 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 declaration that there was a purchase or there was a transaction by this American fellow inside the United States. Now, when they're buying from a company like SWP, which is headquartered in the Cayman Islands, that transaction is actually taking place in the Cayman Islands. That, that buy or sell transaction is being processed by a Cayman Islands corporation. So there is no wealth reporting or transaction reporting to the IRS, to the, to the United States government, nor is there a record of that transaction being reported to the Cayman Islands government. So one of the advantages of dealing with an offshore dealer is that you retain more privacy if you happen to live in a place where it, it would be a reportable transaction to begin but, with. But obviously there's KYC because it's, you know, Cayman super strict on this. Stuff, right? <laughs> of course, of course, this isn't about tax avoidance. This is about privacy. People do enjoy privacy. I think it's, it's really difficult to obtain privacy when you talk about your investments these days. So one of the advantages is basically that those transactions are not uh, reported to outside governments or tax authorities or the Cayman Islands government or tax authority. But that doesn't mean that KYC doesn't take place. KYC is part of the onboarding process. SWP actually does a bank level scrub on all of our clients because we don't want any bad actors inside of the vault that would bring undue attention to the rest of our clients. So we actually go to great lengths to make sure that our clients uh, have a clean background and that they're, they're as far as we know, uh, they're doing this for the right reasons. Now, just to go back to the reporting side of things, when you own precious metals offshore and it's held directly, you don't have any reporting requirements to the IRS. That's actually stated clearly on the IRS website. Precious metals is one of the asset classes that is non-reportable so long as you hold the investment directly, which goes back to the segregated, allocated fashion that we store it. 
But that doesn't mean when you sell it and you realize a capital gain, doesn't mean you don't have to pay your capital gains. Capital gains are always due under all circumstances, and you have an obligation as a U.S. taxpayer to pay your, your, your capital gains tax. I'm going to ask a stupid question, but how does anybody know then? Well, like any, as long like as you anything, don't bring your money back into the U.S., who, who knows whether you've bought and sold gold? Yeah, I mean, it's like any no, investment. That's a bad question to ask. But. Yeah, it's like well, it's like any investment. Your your taxes are a voluntary act. You are declaring what you've chosen to declare. If you misdeclare or you choose not to declare something, it's you, it's by your own choice, by your own doing, and you know, obviously, it's not something that we we would promote to our clients to do. No, obviously, I was just thinking. I was just thinking. Well, how do they know? But I guess you know, that's part of they, what... They, the short answer is they wouldn't know. They, they wouldn't know. That's what makes gold gold. One of the reasons. <laughs> like one of the reasons. Privacy is... Uh, it's hard to put a price on privacy, I guess you could say. So how do you see the gold market developing over the next year or two now? Look, there's a lot of energy right now in the precious metal space. You know, you and I were talking about uh, the crypto space earlier, and you feel it, that is energy. It, sorry, is it too much energy yet? Does it look excessive? Short-term excessive or long-term excessive or just part of a bull market? No, I don't, I, I don't think we're bubbly quite yet. I think right now the, the types of investors that we're seeing right now are people that are fairly sophisticated. Like I said, mid-high net worth individuals, they're just repositioning. They're reallocating their, their investments right now. We have not gotten to the point where the main street mom and pop investor is crowding into the space. And when that happens... There's an old story about the mailman turning up. He'd been delivering the mail to the precious metals dealer every day, cutting through the line every day to drop off the mail. And then eventually one day he was waiting in line to buy his own precious metals. That, that hasn't happened yet. Um, the mainstream investor is, it will wait for gold and silver to be front page news for months. And then, you know, after speaking to their neighbors and maybe finally their banker thinks that buying precious metals is a good idea, then they'll come into the market then you know you're at the top of the market. It's probably time to get out. Um, well, yeah, one of the things that I noticed in the last spike into 2011 was the amount of people selling jewelry. You know, all of the gold, buy gold, sell gold shops. True. Up. Even in Cayman, there's one, right? Yeah, that's true. You, you go through like uh, South Florida and there's billboard upon billboard of, of pawn shops advertising. That's, yeah, you're getting towards the, the top of the market. Exactly. We're not there yet. I think this, this all happened very quickly. Again, this has all really happened. You could argue about a year ago, like I said, the, the, the gold bull market started, but really we took out the record highs in a matter of four months from the end of March until where we are today. We're still seeing a lot of new account openings and, and I think, you know, newsletter writers, people that, are, that have influence over investors are just really starting to pick up on this storyline. You were ahead of the curve. You guys have been talking about gold for a long time, but in, in, in the mainstream's case, it's just starting to become news. And, uh, and so I think we still have, it's fair to say, a year, two years, three years ahead of us. Um, but that doesn't mean that investors should get greedy and pile in now and just wait for tops. Everyone that's coming into precious metals right now has to be cognizant that it is a volatile market and they should have an exit strategy and they shouldn't be fearful of taking some profits when those profits are available to take. Because one mistake that precious metal investors make all the time is that they're so loyal to precious metals once they're in is they never sell it. And they wait for the $10,000 gold, the $50,000 gold. You see these crazy numbers being thrown around by newsletter writers. And the investors fall for it. And, and they just hold on. And they hold on all the way through the bull market. Down to the other side. And how many investors I had buying silver at $40 an ounce back in 2010, 2011. And they still own that silver today. They, had, they never sold it for a profit. In fact, they've been holding out a loss for a long period of time. So you do have to be careful. It's not too late to get in. I think there's still a lot of upside. Silver is only up 60% so far since the beginning of this run. Last time, 2008, 2011, it was up almost 400%. So tons of room. If you look at previous bull markets for precious metals, still a lot of room to go. Yeah, and it feels like, I mean, as, as we talked about today, it's been correcting kind of violently. And that's a good thing because you need to shake out some of the excess, excesses on route, have a few gut checks on route, and that allows a bull market to develop. But, you know, I, these kind of things are, are probably buying opportunities. Absolutely. Completely healthy. You're going to see some profit taking along the way. I kind of, I always look at it as like two steps toward one step back with precious metal markets. Very typical. So everything we're seeing is completely normal. Like I said earlier, it's just the speed and velocity of, 
uh, of this one. And that's, you know, COVID just being a major, major driver there. But I wanted to ask you a question, Raul, while we're talking about gold, and I'm going to flip the mic on you here for a second, because the thing about gold is it's so predictable and so dependable. We know what it does, and we know when it does it best. It does it best in crisis periods, and we know that it acts as a great hedge during those crisis periods. So my question to you today is, how much longer do you think this crisis is going to last? Do you think things are going to get worse? Because if things get worse, that's going to be you know, another injection for the precious metals market. I think, and I've maintained the view for a long time, is that the global economy is going to be weaker for longer. We're used to recession, recovery, everything returns back to normal, and we kind of repair from there. I kind of think it's recession, partial recovery, long time of not recovering. If that's the case, you know, I worry about solvency issues, companies going bust. You know, you'll see it all over the place. You'll see it in Canada where you are, you'll see it in the Cayman Islands, you'll see it all over the world where companies just give up because they just don't have the cash flow to service their debts or their overheads. So in an environment like that, there are only two things that governments and central banks know how to do, and that's to do more. Mm-hmm. Now, if the central bank prints more, it doesn't look like they're going to do that because it's not a liquidity crisis, it's a solvency crisis. So if your restaurant's going under and money, the cost of money is zero, but you can't borrow it and you've got no revenue, it's useless to you. So that doesn't help. So what you actually need is governments to help. And that's governments by you know, giving you a, a loan that they forgive so you don't have to pay it back or that they you know, help you pay your staff or whatever it may be, right? But that goes into the government balance sheet and then the central banks have to buy it off the governments. So basically, a slower economy for longer means that there's just more currency in circulation or more printing of money. And more printing of money is just bullish gold. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it's as simple as that. I, I was talking to somebody earlier today about, okay, what is the bad scenario for gold? Because deflation, inflation, basically, you know, inflation, gold does well. Deflation means the central banks are going to print more, so gold does well, right? So it's bizarre because most people think deflation is bad for gold, but in this scenario, it's not. It's fully bullish. So the worst case is the global economy, or the US economy growing at 1.5% and inflation at 1.5%. That's terrible for gold because there's no point owning it. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the risk as I see it, uh, and everything else plays to gold's advantage. So, you know, the risk for me for gold comes later. It's where do we come to out of this crisis once we've gone through the slow growth period? Once we get to that stable period, okay, you probably don't want to own gold because mm-hmm. it's likely to correct for a few years and do its usual thing, right? Gold always does this. It goes up, has a good rally, spends ages correcting, goes up, you know, because over time it's trying to adjust for the devaluation of currencies. You know, I chart gold versus 27 currencies in one basket, equally weighted. And it's amazing because it does its job. You know, as currencies go down, gold just keeps going up against all these currencies over time. It does it in this stair-step pa- pattern. And, we're, you know, we're in the up phase of it. And eventually, we'll get into the next step. And it'll just trade sideways with a 40% correction, do its thing, and then it'll go up again. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it does its thing. I think it goes on. I think we've probably got another two years. I think we've got big fiscal stimulus from every government to come. And particularly after the US election, we'll sit all over the world. You'll sit in Canada, we'll sit in the UK, we'll sit in Australia, we'll sit all everywhere, fiscal stimulus, with the central banks trying to backstop it. So if that's the case, and a lot of them are going to do really big stimulus, you know, the new Green Deal or, you know, some 5G infrastructure spend, a new bunch of bridges and roads and all, you know, that could be inflationary, might not be. But that amount of new currency printing is not great for currency markets. Now, if everybody's doing it all at the same time, you may not see it in the dollar itself. You might get chopped around in that, in wherever it's happening, but you'll see it in the gold price. And that's why it's important to remember, um, again, we talked earlier about exit strategy. So after that two-year period, let's keep in mind, if we're investing in precious metals now, that we have a plan after two years to exit, that can affect what type of products that you purchase. Uh, because you may not want to exit all at once. So if you're buying larger format bars, you have to sell the entire thing all at once. You may want to buy some smaller denominations and kind Relate, of average scale out. out over time and scale out over time. So these are things that, you know, these are conversations like we're having today. Basically, the conversation we're having today 
is more or less a typical conversation with a gold investor. You want to answer all these questions for them so that they understand all of the options clearly. And then you, you know, we provide them with as much information, short of a recommendation of, uh, of how to kind of build their portfolio out. Are you seeing demand from non kind of US, Europe, Canada, foreigners? Because Absolutely. obviously in this currency market, you know, we're seeing currencies suffer, right? The Turkish lira is, you know, collapsing and one minute it's Brazil, next minute it's Mexico, et cetera. Do you see those guys hedging currency risks by buying gold? I mean, a lot of, look, if you're a European investor, chances are you're going to be buying from Degusa in Munich or, you know, a dealer in Zurich and the guys in Singapore and Asia are going to be buying from those local market. There tends to be some localization of precious metal markets, but we do have clients from all over the world. And I can tell you that people feel the same in Latin America as they do uh, in Germany, we do have a number of German clients that use our services. And so there, it's, it, it's certainly not U.S. centric, this problem or this uncertainty that's driving people towards precious metals. I think anyone who follows the markets anywhere uh, is, is, is certainly feeling that risk and hedging against it. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, listen, it's fascinating because I think a lot of people talk about physical and most people don't really know what it means and how to do it and stuff like that. So hopefully we've enlightened a few people here to understand what it's like. If you're trading, use futures, do whatever you want. It makes no difference. But if, you, if you're trying to offset wealth or protect wealth, keep it stored, keep it away, keep it safe. Yeah, wealth preservation, wealth insurance, those are kind of the, the coin terms often for precious metals. Raul, well, look, we appreciate the relationship with Real Vision. Uh, we're, we're very honored to have you as a client personally. And, and you know we try to take care of your guys uh, very, very well. We try to treat them with the same respect that we have for you. So, um, you know, any questions that, uh, that, that your followers have, obviously they can get in touch with us. And we also do have an entire series of videos that explains these nuts and bolts of owning precious metals. So if you're a beginner and you want to learn from the ground up, uh, there's 16 episodes called inside the vault. You can check those out and probably help you uh, tremendously. And also, I'm going to uh, nag you to go into the comment section after the video's out, because then people can ask you some questions and you can just respond. Sure. Because, Happy uh, to do it. Again, people just want to know stuff because it's a different market to what we're used to. You don't, you don't phone up interactive brokers and you know, put an order in on the screen because it's different. So it's outside of a lot of people's knowledge base, even though it's a very simple and very old market. Um, I think people will, will have questions on how it works. Absolutely. People tend to think that investing in precious metals is complicated or it's only for the ultra wealthy. Both are completely false. It's actually one of the simplest investments you'll ever make. And we're happy to help for sure. Cool. All right, Mark. Good to catch up. And I'll see you in Cayman at some point soon. Hopefully. We're allowed back in the country. I can't wait to get down there. I'm jonesing uh, to make a trip down there and see the vault. And uh, yeah, oh, definitely hook up when I'm down there. Thanks. As soon as winter in Vancouver starts, you'll be itching to come down there. <laughs> Thank all you. Right, all. Great to see you. Thanks so Same. much. Take care. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.